the development of vaccines is one of medical science's earliest breakthroughs. The first manufactured vaccine against smallpox was developed by British physician Edward Jenner in 1796. The effect was dramatic. A disease that killed 500 million people in the last century alone was entirely eradicated by 1979. During the past century, um, we have increased our lifespan by 30 years. Most of that increase is due to vaccines. Before vaccines, pertussis or whooping cough routinely killed 8,000 people a year, mostly children. Rubella or German measles would cause birth defects in as many as 20,000 children every year. Measles would commonly cause between 500 and 1,000 to die every year. Diphtheria was, was the most common killer of teenagers, all this before vaccines. But I think you could argue that no vaccine uh, captured, I think, the emotions, certainly of the American public, as much as the polio vaccine did. I think it was just a very, very emotional disease for this country. For children everywhere, the arrival of summer brings joy and freedom. But in the 1930s and 40s, parents dreaded summer, because this was the start of the polio season. When we look back upon polio today, you look back upon what was really a summer plague. It came every year. It came like locusts. And newspapers would have almost baseball box scores of the numbers of kids who would come down with it in that week. It would start around late May and go up in June and higher in July and spike in August. And then by Labor Day, the sum plague would be over. Polio can strike at any age, but it mainly affects children under the age of five. It would hit this kid and not this kid, and nobody knew why. It would descend on Denver, but not on San Francisco, and no one knew why. All you knew was that every summer, thousands of very unlucky kids would come down with this insidious disease that usually left them incapacitated and often killed them. Whenever you have an epidemic disease that seems to come out of nowhere and all sorts of children are getting sick, there's great fear and, you know, kids don't go to the pool, they don't go to school. Data from the time shows how polio gained a terrifying foothold throughout America. In the 30s, the worst year affected some 9,700 people. In the 40s, the numbers grew. And by 1952, outbreaks hit a record 57,000 victims in one year alone. You looked at these children walking down the street and as, as if they had, had gone to war. I mean, as, it was as if they were veterans of, of a foreign war. And it was young children. I think it was just a very, very emotional disease for this country. Very little was known about polio, or as it was also called, infantile paralysis. It was known by then that it was a virus disease, but there was no way to treat it. And there wasn't really sure how it was transmitted. People weren't sure. There was a tremendous amount of myth and misinformation that surrounded the disease. People thought that the, the uh, disease was spread by cats. They thought it was spread by fleas. They thought that it was, it was spread by organ grinders, monkeys. They thought that it was spread by bananas that had been imported from South America. They thought that it could be cured by ox blood or, or, or sassafras or wood shavings. People had all kinds of theories about it. You shouldn't take your kids to a public pool. Nobody should give birthday parties. I mean, it was like a, a, a phantom enemy, this illness, and I was scared to death as a young mother. Polio is spread by sneezing, coughing, and contact with human waste. But nobody knew that back then. 
There was no prevention. There was no cure. There was no protection. You could be a good parent, a bad parent, an indifferent parent, and you still had no way of protecting your child against polio. What doctors did know about the disease was terrifying. The virus reproduces in the mouth, it reproduces in the intestine, gets into the blood, and invades the nervous system. And what it does is it kills a particular cell in the nervous system called the interior horn cell. And this cell tells the muscles what to do. It's like cutting the wires to a light bulb. The light goes off. The disease was highly contagious. Polio would spread silently and then pick out its victim and continue to spread silently, pick out another victim. The prognosis was uncertain. Sometimes it came and went like the flu, leaving no lasting damage. In many cases, polio caused paralysis. Even though often temporary, paralysis was particularly dangerous when it affected the lungs. I caught polio when I was 21 months old, back in 1952. Our house was immediately quarantined. I started showing signs of paralysis. And at that time, uh, you got in an iron lung. That was what happened. And I was in an iron lung for approximately 11 days. The iron lung was an early respirator. It worked by alternating pressure on the body to inflate, then deflate the lungs. The image of kids having to be put into our lungs, if you're not able to control your diaphragm muscles during that time period, the machine basically is breathing for you. Now, a lot of kids eventually regain control of their diaphragm muscles, so their time in the iron lung is finite, but it's a pretty gruesome thing where, you know, you're sort of inside a machine that's breathing for you. We would get these children coming up and they would be screaming and the anxiety level was unbelievable. You try to comfort them and how do you comfort a four or five year old? He didn't even have his teddy bear. He could take nothing with him. And I remember the faces on some of these kids, you know, in agony. Just picture your own two year old, you know, can't breathe and it's just dreadful. The lucky ones would survive, but many would suffer lasting problems, pain, weakness, and atrophy of the muscles. You just try to keep them alive with uh, artificial breathing and uh, physical therapy, and then try to equip them with some kind of gear that would help them walk again, if you've managed to save their lives. Children in wheelchairs and leg braces became a common sight. Thousands of families mourned for their children who had not survived. Worst of all, everyone knew the plague would return summer after summer. And so the stage was set for a president, a scientist, and the American people to beat back the disease that was crippling the nation. Really, when you talk about polio or infantile paralysis, you, you must in the United States begin with FDR, with President Roosevelt. He got it at the age of 39 in 1921 and spent the rest of his life really trying to find the cure and the prevention. He never found the cure. He died in 1945 still having polio. But what Roosevelt did was to put together a voluntary organization that was absolutely extraordinary.
Roosevelt's organization was called the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, later to become the March of Dimes. It was founded in 1938. And its goal was to collect money to do research to conquer children's diseases, and polio was its primary target. A dime was the currency of the time that was a meaningful contribution from a child. Their door-to-door -door fundraising program was called the Mother's March. Fight polio tonight. Let the marching mothers know you're waiting for them. The March of Dimes people would go around, you know, go door to door and so actually in the 50s, the majority of all disease money that was raised was raised for polio. I remember uh, going out with my mother uh, on the Mother's March and you would go around the neighborhood and if the light were on, on the front porch, then I would go to the house and collect a little cardboard thing that had inserts for coins to go in. And we would gather those and ship those, literally, to the White House. The dimes poured in. In the first year alone, more than a million dollars worth. Polio became a national cause, spearheaded by the president. Even Hollywood got on board. There are a lot of parents whose children are healthy and happy now who live in fear. I know I do. The fear, my friends, is polio. What made the March of Dimes such an extraordinary organization was that, for one thing, they used the latest techniques in advertising and public relations. They got celebrities like Mickey Rooney and Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley. And I mean, I have a picture in my book of a very uncomfortable Richard Nixon pumping gas for polio. They also used poster children. You know, give me your money and help me walk. And it was dime by dime by dime. These were Americans pulling together. And they were pulling together to some degree because this was a children's disease. And having a visual disease where you saw leg braces and you saw crutches and you saw iron lungs was something that was simply intolerable to the American conscience. And they united as a people to do away with it. I like it. Roosevelt died in 1945, but the March of Dimes carried on. The organization's goal was to create a polio vaccine. In 1947, they sought out a bright young scientist by the name of Jonas Salk. At the time, Salk was running his own lab at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, working on an influenza vaccine. Salk saw his opportunity. There were three known types of polio, and a successful vaccine would need to combat them all. His first step was to make sure there weren't more by performing a mundane process known as typing. The complete drudgery of the poliovirus typing program. And that's something that no budding scientist at the beginning of his or her career would want to take on, but this was an entree. And what Salk understands very early on is that, you know, you sort of go where the money is. And the money was coming from the National Foundation with very, very large grants for polio. Here was a place he could get started. I mean, the good news was that there was a philanthropical base that was going to support him here. The bad news was it was Pittsburgh, which at the time was in the backwater of, of science. Not only that, the work itself was far from glamorous. Dr. Salk and his research team were in the basement. They were looking for the live polio virus. 